before we start, how much time do I have so I don't abuse my privilege here? Oh, how much time do you need? <laughs> uh, let's just say I'll try not to abuse the privilege. Uh, how about about 10 minutes? That's fine. That's fine. Uh, senators, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bradley Meyerson. I live in Pollitt. Uh, I recently retired after practicing law in Manchester for 38 years, um, largely criminal defense and some plaintiff's personal injury. During that time, I handled about uh, four to six police misconduct cases, two of which went to trial, uh, one of which uh, was a plaintiff's verdict and the other was a hung jury. Now, uh, qualified immunity for some reason, and this was going back maybe 30 years, was not an issue in any of those cases. Uh, I don't remember why, but uh, it, it certainly is an issue now. And I, I would like to start by kind of going maybe a 30,000 feet view of things. Why, why is this bill being proposed? Why abolish qualified immunity? Well, you're the Senate Judiciary Committee. Your focus, presumably, is to create just laws based on sound policies to benefit the greatest number of individuals and not to favor a protected class or group of persons. Abolishing qualified immunity would accomplish that very goal of benefiting the greatest number of persons. It's very simple. The bill creates meaningful accountability for a taxpayer funded arm of government that exerts enormous power and control over the citizenry. It does not create Abolishing, uh, abolishing qualified community would not create what is known as strict liability. In other words, you just present your case and you've established liability with putting in a minimum amount of facts. It simply removes the unjust judicially created doctrine that shields police from the consequences of their own wrongdoing. Now, I'm going to speak to a lot of the objections that uh, I've heard from opponents of the bill. And the benefit of, of going last year is that uh, going through my notes of what folks had to say at last week's hearing, we heard a lot of alarmists, alarmists from the law enforcement community telling us that abolishing qualified immunity will open the floodgates to frivolous lawsuits. And since I've done plaintiff's work, uh, I can tell you, and We've heard that for years from insurance companies when this committee and the legislature as a whole passed laws to broaden claimants' rights or to remove unjust defenses, such as the seatbelt defense. Frivolous lawsuits is simply a bad cliche that is being used in this bill to take away rights of claimants to seek compensation for the courts. There is no evidence beyond, and it, speculation is not evidence. It hasn't happened in Colorado, which, which has had qualified immunity for a year, abolished qualified immunity a year ago. There's no evidence that abolishing qualified immunity would somehow, uh, use another cliche, open the floodgates to a wave of frivolous lawsuits against the police. The statute is worded in such a way that it, uh, it limits frivolous lawsuits because it adopts what's called the English rule, which is that the loser pays. It's if the court, and this I'm referring to subsection D, um, judgments entered in favor of defendant, a court may award reasonable attorney's fees and other litigation costs reasonably incurred to the defendant for defending any claims the court deems frivolous. So that is a significant check uh, against the fear that abolishing qualified immunity would uh, open the floodgates to frivolous lawsuits. 
And the I'm not wild about this portion of the bill. I understand that uh, there's a reason for it being in there. There are very, very few statutes in Vermont which uh, incorporate the English rule that the loser pays. But I'm comforted by the fact that uh, a court has the discretion to determine whether a lawsuit is frivolous, a lawsuit against police or a department or both is frivolous or not. So I think that's a significant check against the possibility of uh, uh, an excessive number of lawsuits. I should also say from my own perspective of handling these cases and also uh, doing personal injury work, cases against police are hard enough to win even if there is no qualified immunity. It's tantamount to suing a, uh, a physician in a medical malpractice case. Why? Well, in part because the public, they favor the police, okay? Police officers were, were taught from, uh, you know, from childhood that they are trustworthy and deserve our respect, as with doctors. So in front of a jury, a police officer is going to have that built-in respect. And that will be a check, I think, on the, against the success of a, of a potential lawsuit. There is no evidence that abolishing qualified immunity would jeopardize public safety. It hasn't happened in Colorado or Connecticut, which is abolished qualified immunity, nor New Mexico. The civil justice system should be balanced between the claimant and the defendant, in this case, the police or police department. Police brutality cases, uh, well, in police brutality cases, that balance, if you have qualified immunity, is fictitious. The police and police departments who employ them have a huge unfair advantage in litigation because of qualified immunity to the detriment of the, of the victim and their families. And this is wrong. It's morally wrong. It's legally wrong. And abolishing qualified immunity and adopting S254 would eliminate that. If someone is injured due to someone else, due to the negligence of another, the wrongdoer is held accountable through the civil justice system. If a doctor makes a mistake, the doctor can be sued and held accountable by a jury. It's hard to do, but if the injury is uh, aggravated enough and there's liability, the doctor will be held accountable. Why should it be any different when an officer harms a citizen, whether physically through brutality or a violation of constitutional rights by illegally stopping someone, illegally searching them, and as in the Zulo case, which I'm sure you're familiar with, seizing the car and then forcing the, uh, the person just leaving them on their own. There is a screening process that lawyers engage in, in evaluating whether to take a case on a contingent fee, which is how most lawyers would take uh, police misconduct cases. Is the client believable? Am I willing to, do I feel that the case is strong enough to invest in at least one expert, for example, a police uh, misconduct expert, former police officer? Am I willing to risk the possibility of a verdict for the defendant uh, if this bill were to be passed and you've got the loser pays provision? All of those factors make these types of cases very, very difficult to litigate and to win. Qualified immunity, abolishing qualified immunity, will encourage lawyers to represent citizens harmed by the police, whether physically or by egregious, uh, egregious violation of Vermont or United States constitutional rights. And it will provide justice by allowing police misconduct cases to be heard by juries, which is something that David Slay pointed out, rather than uh, dying in the crib, so to speak, of being unfairly dismissed before trial by a judge without any 
discovery to find out the merits of the case. Uh, I think it's also going to increase trust in government and the police because egregious behavior by the police and by the departments employing them will be, uh, uh, they will be held to account. You have, I'm sorry, Senator, you were about to say something, I interrupted you? No, I'm- Okay. I'm, um, I'm, I'm in a bit of pain, Brad, from some- I'm sorry. Stuff, but no, no, it's fine. It's not your fault. And I was just sighing from that. Yeah. Um, there are attorneys, there's an attorney's fees provision for this successful claimant in the bill, which I think is a very good thing. It's not a novel approach because of course, under the federal civil rights statute, 42 United States code section 1983, there is a, uh, an attorney's fees component but it's not automatic. The judge has to find that there's substantial merit to the lawsuit or that you substantially succeeded. You have to have uh, an, an expert justify the attorney's fees and expenses. And then there has to be a hearing in front of a judge to determine whether an award of attorney's fees and expenses is warranted. I went through that um, in a successful case that I had and Judge Billings, who was the federal judge at the time, did cut down some of my attorney's fees and expenses. So it's not an automatic ticket to get your attorney's fees and expenses, even if you win. Plus under, uh, under Vermont law, there are attorney's fees awarded in other cases where uh, Senate Judiciary and the legislature as a whole found it uh, a, a, a positive social benefit to encourage the filing of lawsuits. In particular, I'm thinking of the construction statute, because otherwise attorneys wouldn't be willing to help homeowners and take those cases on a contingent fee basis. Now, we heard uh, from Sheriff Marcou and others that abolishing qualified immunity is going to discourage qualified applicants for uh, police positions because they're, uh, they're afraid of being sued. That's a fiction. There is no correlation that's been demonstrated at all between the difficulty in filling police openings currently and abolishing qualified immunity. Manchester recently had three officers leave and just as quickly they rehired, well, they rehired, they hired two new officers to fill those positions. If an officer doesn't want to continue in law enforcement because he or she is afraid of being sued, uh, than or being held accountable for their actions, is this somebody that we we're really want carrying a badge and a gun and, and driving a patrol car? I guess taking that argument by the police that it's abolishing qualified immunity would discourage uh, retention of police officers or hiring of police officers. That's, that's really kind of code for saying, uh, well, we should be allowed to relax the standards for hiring police officers. And there is, a, there is an issue in Vermont about police departments hiring rejects from other departments. Most recently in Woodstock, an officer who was fired by another department was hired by Woodstock. It's happened in Rutland, it's happened in Ludlow, and it's happened uh, in Woodstock. Uh, Senator White talked about, uh, raised some concerns at the last hearing about insurance issues and indemnification. Um, and this, this gets into a, a kind of a broad issue of, well, who's gonna bear the loss? Under, cur under current law, qualified immunity, since it basically bars citizens from the courthouse door seeking redress against the police, uh, especially the poor and people of color who were most often victimized by the police misconduct. It takes away the remedy for the harms that they've suffered. Uh, Stephen Gillum from the uh, Wyndham County NAACP, he asked you last week, what about the people? He mentioned about how people having bad experiences with police officers suffer post-traumatic stress disorder, among other harms, which also affects, the, also affects their families and society at large. But I believe that this bill will help those harmed by police misconduct who seek compensation for their injuries 
and I'm specifically referring to, uh, by taking away qualified immunity, I'm uh, speaking of the indemnification clause in sections E and F. All police are insured. When I tried my first case, actually it's my first civil case, it was a civil rights case against city of Rutland and two officers. The jury returned a verdict against the officers and the city, and they also returned a verdict for punitive damages against the officers. Well, those damages were paid either by the city or by the insurance company. So having insurance coverage, so, and this goes to the issue of, well, if, is it an intentional tort? Will there be insurance coverage? There aren't gonna be officers losing their homes if they are uh, held accountable by a jury for, uh, for what they did to a citizen. The indemnification provisions of sections E and F shift the loss for police misconduct to the municipalities and to their insurers. That's what insurance is for. And the departments involving the officers involved suffer the loss also. Those, are, those entities are better able to handle the losses than the, uh, the victim. Could we uh, wrap up, Brad? Yes. Please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is a victim's rights bill, I think, above all. You all and, and your, your colleagues in, the, in the, uh, the House have spent much time and effort passing legislation to protect victims. This is a victim's right bill. You're protecting victims of police misconduct by giving them the key to the courthouse. It's not an automatic jury verdict for the plaintiff. You are simply helping them achieve justice and accountability for the police. And uh, I think it's a, I, I, I give you Senator Sears tremendous credit, Senator Baruth and uh, Senator Ram Hinsdale for sponsoring this bill. I am sorry that you are uh, taking such, such heat from the law enforcement community. That's wrong, uh, but this bill is, is eminently reasonable and uh, I appreciate your interest in having me testify. Thank you, Brad. I, I want to mention Senator Ballant was also, is also a sponsor of the bill. Yes. Um, I get, you know, you've raised the specter of the frivolous lawsuit, and I think that's something we all are concerned with. As an attorney or as a retired attorney now, would you take a case um, if, you know, the, unless you were darn sure you could win? Knowing that the, that that the attorney fees may, you know, the loser pays. Well, <clears throat> number of criteria. Number one, there have to be good facts. Okay, are there witnesses, photographs, injuries? Number two, what's the client like? Do they have a record? Because of course the defense counsel is going to tear them apart. All right. Can they withstand cross-examination? How would they appear in front of the jury? Number three, what experts am I gonna need? Where am I gonna find them? How much are they gonna to cost to establish liability on the part of the police? And of course, if there's an injury, I need to have medical experts come in. So all of those factor into the equation of whether or not the case is worth taking. Does that answer your question? Because um, we haven't really, we, we've talked about the frivolous lawsuit and how to avoid them, but we haven't talked about the requirement in the, in the section that um, outlines uh, the loser pays. If um, I felt I had a good enough case, I'd be willing to take it, notwithstanding loser pays. I think that will okay. discourage some, um, maybe someone who's not familiar with police misconduct cases from taking a case. But um, even though I'm not thrilled about it, I understand why it's in the bill. It's a counterbalance to the um, attorney's fees and costs being awarded to the uh, party that substantially prevails. Again, it's not automatic. It's gotta be screened by a judge no. either way. Thank you. Other questions for Brad, Senator White. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Morrison. Um, I do disagree with you on a couple points and then I have a couple questions, but I disagree with you that this is the only way to hold police accountable. And I think there's a lot of efforts going on right now in Vermont around the um, Criminal Justice Council and their professional regulations committee to hold police accountable. So I do disagree with you on that. And I'm not so sure that the right now in this environment that the public actually favors the police. So I, I just, I'm not asking a question about that. I'm just saying that I disagree with you on those two things, but I will, I do have a couple questions. <clears throat> One, I, I, and I'm not an attorney, so, and I'm just really trying to figure this out. I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I'm really trying to figure this out and make sure we do the right thing. And I understand that um, what was told to us in Iqbal, that that case, that qualified immunity prevented the discovery from happening. But my understanding is that that case had nothing to do with qualified immunity. It had to do with the federal pleading standard, and that it wasn't, didn't, qualified immunity didn't even figure into that. So I'm a little surprised that that was used as an example. And my two, and then Colorado only does constitutional violations. This bill expands it to any statutory or common law violations also. So they aren't comparable at all. Um, and this is much more expansive than Colorado. And my question all is, the, I, I've read, a ton of stuff on this. And I've read the Zulu case. And I also read the, um, if you Google Zulu, the first thing that comes up or one of the first things that comes up is the summary explanation that was given to us by one of our legislative council attorneys. And in, in reading that and in reading the case, the way I understand this is that, and I know there's a difference of opinion here, but the way I understand this is that Zulu did the Supreme Court did create a right of action and a right to sue. So I'm a little confused because when I asked before if, if there was a different standard that we could use and if, the, if we didn't, people didn't already have the right to, of action, the right to sue, that's what I thought Zulu did. And I... I know there's a difference of opinion, but that was the information given to us by our legislative council, not not Ben, but in a at a different time on a different case, on a different issue. So I, I confused. Did it or did does it or does it not create a right of action? Zulo. Yeah. Well, Zulo created a, a cause of action for violation of. Uh, citizens' rights under the Vermont Constitution. Right. Right. Um, what, what I have dealt with I, it has been where there's injury. Um, you know, uh, uh, common law torts. So, you know, injury, false imprisonment, for example. Uh, Zulo only created that right as pertaining to uh, harms suffered on the, for violation of, a, uh, of the Vermont Constitution. Right. And that's why, but, and we keep comparing this saying that it's comparable to Colorado because Colorado, um, they haven't seen um, any increase in suits and they haven't seen um, police officers abandoning ship. And that's what Zulo does here. That's what Zulo already does in Vermont. And in Colorado, it is limited to constitutional violations. So I, I, don't, I don't understand what... Um, You're saying that Colorado is not an apt comparison for... Yes, because it only, it only addresses violations under the Colorado Constitution. That's... You know, that's a fair point. We're seizing on Colorado uh, as the bright, shiny object because, um, you know, they abolish qualified immunity and, and they've done that. That's been in place the longest. I think Connecticut and New Mexico 
uh, were, were more recent. You could always sue in Vermont, you could always sue a police officer for, you know, for violation of, of federal constitutional rights and for, and for uh, uh, common law torts. It's just that Zulo, well, um, maybe I'm wandering off track here. Am, am I addressing your question? Well, my, my question is it kind of twofold, I guess. We compare it to Colorado and say, we have not seen a lot of suits and we have not seen uh, negative impacts from Colorado's um, elimination of qualified immunity. Colorado uh, eliminated it for constitutional violations, not statutory and common law, just constitutional violations. So comparing it to out this bill doesn't make any sense to me because this is a much broader bill. And my understanding is that Zulu created a right to action for violations of the Vermont Constitution. So if that's already in effect, then I don't understand what, um, I don't understand why qualified immunity stands in the way of filing a suit against a police officer for, um, for a um, violation of the Vermont Constitution. Well, because a violation, of, you have to show a violation of, of a clearly established right. Yeah, but, and I, I think that the misinterpretation of clearly established right is. Um, that, that is a rule that has been stretched to the breaking point to shield police. If, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to belabor this, but when I read, um, there is a 2015 case that says a clearly established right is one that is sufficiently clear that every reasonable official would have understood that what he is doing violates that right. And it doesn't say that it has to be the exactly the same. It says that a reasonable official would understand and that, that to me says that the way it's being interpreted by people, not necessarily in Vermont and not necessarily in the Second Circuit Court, that, they, that they're misinterpreting what a clearly established right is. So um, what is the standard we should use? Um, I think you've asked some great questions. And I'm not sure this witness, you know, Brad was here. Uh, I'm not sure he's an expert on this. Well, let me try to answer it. If, you, if, if you'll have it, if you'll have it. So, yeah, I was asked that if Jay Diaz or Ben wanted to hop in at this point. I would defer to them. But go ahead. Right. Pardon me. Uh, no, I, no, go ahead, Brad. I'm, uh, look, I, sure. yeah, I just Senator White, um, I've, I've read... I mean, the, the example that sticks in my mind of the abuse of the, um, of the standard uh, is that uh, a case involving a prison uh, <clears throat> a corrections official, not in Vermont, who uh, maced a prisoner, a defenseless prisoner causing harm that lawsuit was dismissed because it was not of the same uh, reason, not same conduct as the case on which uh, it was a, a presidential case, which was where a prison, uh, uh, a corrections officer punched a defenseless inmate. And the court said, and I, I, I don't remember the name of the case, the court said, you know, we're sorry, but uh, that's the standard. And this, okay. is, this is being applied all over the country to deprive I, people of-, of I workers. understand that, but I, uh, that was not in Vermont and it wasn't in the second, second Circuit. And it was a corrections officer. It wasn't a law enforcement officer. So if we're really serious about, quali about eliminating qualified immunity for cons violation of constitutional rights, why don't we apply it to everybody, including us? And I know law us enforcement- meaning the legislature? Including the legislature. I, I remember that discussion 
last week. You have absolute immunity. Prosecutors have absolute immunity. Judges have absolute immunity. That's not an issue. You can say anything. I know. That's what I'm saying. Right. Why? Why would we? Why not just eliminate immunity? Well, here's 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 why. Police carry a tremendous amount of authority. You might not be in office, uh, you know, next uh, next November. Or you That's might probably voted, true. You might be voted out of office. I hope not, but you know. Uh, police interact on a daily basis with citizens. They carry guns and badges and tremendous authority. And unfortunately, there are officers who abuse that authority and harm citizens. Yes. Okay. Qualified immunity is the number one roadblock to holding these officers accountable. Their interactions with the public are different than uh, a legislator or a judge or a prosecutor. It's, it's a different level of involvement and uh, it, it's a legal check on abolishing qualified immunity with further the legal checks on their conduct. That's kind I of do. an awkward analogy, but. I, I do I understand that, but I, I just am, most of the examples that are given don't, aren't, in Vermont, and they're not even in the Second Circuit. So I'm just, um, and I, so I realize that, but um, anyway, th those are just my concerns. What, what, what can I say to address those? Well, you can give me real examples, I guess, of where Under it's Barouf. been unduly yeah. used Barouf. in Vermont and the Second Circuit. I'm, I'm wondering if, um, I, I would like to hear what, uh, Jay and Ben. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I, I these these are questions that need Bradley, to be answered if the bill's going to pass. Compelling, but I feel like we're we're basically in a yeah. uh, an extended one on one rather than. I know. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Senator, I'll I'll just finish uh, by saying Thank I don't you. have the answers for you as far as Vermont or the Second Circuit, but Jay uh, Jay Diaz Jay's Jay's yeah. letter points out four Vermont cases. Um, the letter of 120, I believe they're Vermont cases. Keene versus Snyder, Ke Kent versus Katz, Winfield versus Trottier. I thought there were four cases, but I only see three here. Jay, do you want to, are you, are yeah. you available? Please, thank yes. you. Good morning, all. Happy to answer any questions. Again, for the record, well, uh, Diaz, I think the, the, yeah, the, the question basically is what about Vermont cases? Yes, so Senator Sears, as you just referenced, uh, we noted three cases that went up to the Second Circuit uh, specifically uh, that were Vermont based cases where qualified immunity resulted in. The, uh, despite there being, despite the court agreeing that there was a rights violation, the uh, Second Circuit found qualified immunity applied. And so the plaintiffs lost based on qualified immunity. In one of those cases, the plaintiffs, due to their loss on qualified immunity, actually had to pay the defendants or was ordered to pay the, the, the defendants uh, costs. So uh, it, it can have pretty serious harms to plaintiffs, even when the court acknowledges and agrees that their rights were violated. Keene versus Snyder was, Mr. Keene was questioned in his living room about a possible DUI. Troopers decided to arrest him on suspicion of DUI, later dismissed by the state attorney, and he refused to go with them Troopers pepper sprayed him, took him to the floor, and repeatedly punched, elbowed, and kneed him in front of his crying 14-year-old daughter. The district court denied qualified immunity. The Second Circuit reversed granting qualified immunity because the trooper's action did not violate clearly established law without deciding whether the force was excessive. That, 
that's one that um, struck me as particularly egregious that he, even the state's attorney declined to prosecute and yet the person was punched, pepper sprayed and so forth, um, elbowed in front of his crying 14 year old daughter. And even though the district court uh, denied qualified immunity, the second circuit reversed it. That is a Vermont case, am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, there were, I think it was, again, there, were, there was two Vermont state troopers. I, I, and I think what this gets to is that there are serious violations uh, of people's constitutional rights, federal and state, um, as well as their other civil rights, statutory rights, common law rights. And what we find is that in some of those cases, not all, but in some of those cases, if there's not clearly established law, uh, the court is, gonna, is compelled by its prior rulings uh, and precedent around qualified immunity to say, you know, the officer is not going to be, um, be held liable here, even though we agree they violated the person's rights, used excessive force, et cetera, um, you know, violated their civil rights, discriminated against them, any of those kinds of things, um, the court could say, yes, that's true. But because of our doctrine of qualified immunity, which the legislature has yet to say anything about, we are going to um, protect uh, this officer from liability or you know, the, their, their employer really from liability. And that's what this bill is about. It's about removing that, that hurdle that, 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 that prevents people from accessing justice uh, when their rights are violated. When their rights are not violated, if there is no excessive force, if there is no uh, violation of their free speech rights or, or their equal protection rights, then there's no case. Then the case is over. Uh, this bill will only support victims of recognized rights violations and ensure that they get some measure of justice. Can, can you speak a little? Senator White believes that Zulu um, created... Um, what's your impression of that? You heard her questions. Yes, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about Zulu. I was, uh, the ACLU represented Mr. Zulu, as I think you know, we, you know, I was, uh, uh, my, my colleague and, and I, Leah Ernst and I represented Greg um, in a four to five year case uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court. And what the decision uh, says to me it, related to this bill is, one, it says, uh, yes, it, it gives people the right under the Vermont Constitution to sue for constitutional violations. Um, and you don't need to worry about the Court Claims Act. And I won't go into all that. The bigger, piece, I think, in the confusion is around two things. One, Zulo uh, is unclear at best on the point of whether it's holding around whether plaintiffs can get a damage remedy, whether victims can get justice, essentially, uh, whether that applies to the state only or to the state and municipal employees. So that's left unclear. And that's because there's an absence of, of you know, legislative direction. The second part, and more importantly, is that what the court laid out as the test for whether victims of rights violations could get justice, could get damages was based on qualified immunity. It's not the same, but it's a qualified, as this court said, a qualified immunity like test. And we believe that if the, and that was created in the absence again of legislative direction. They, they acknowledge that they're doing it because we don't have legislative direction. That's the way we're gonna go as a court. So it's incumbent upon you all to take, to, to, to now I think invest that time and as you've been doing, and, 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 and make some decisions here about how, how the court should act in these situations. Um, we believe it's very important that people be able to access justice and not have to jump over these hurdles, which are presented by qualified immunity in general and also presented um, in Zillow. Thank you. Does that help Senator White?
I wish I was an attorney because I, I really do find it all very confusing. Um, and it, it is helpful, but um, I do find it confusing. Yeah, I'll just, I'll try to summarize it really succinctly. Zulo uh, does not cover, does not cover municipal employees. That will have to be decided in later cases. And two, Zulo creates a test similar to qualified immunity that still presents hurdles to getting justice for constitutional rights, uh, Article 11 specifically. So uh, may I ask one more question, Senator Sears? Oh, where'd he go? There. He's, he's coming back now. He must have jumped off. OK. So what should the stand, should there be any standard at all? Or should, uh, is it, should people be able to just sue if they feel their rights have been, I mean, is, should there be any standard at all? And I guess that's a question for Jay, because you said that Zulo established a different standard, slightly different than the federal standard, but what, what sh should there be a standard and what should it be? Or should there not be any standard? It's just, um, and, and again, I guess, and I know that that it's that police officers have huge authority and um, uh, power over us. But the case that was that um, Mr. Myerson gave was a corrections officer. But we're not including them in here. We're not. So I, yeah. So, yeah, Senator White, thank you for the question. I think to answer the question, should there be a standard? We believe that the standard should be, were your rights violated? That's the question that we want to see asked. And that's the question the court has to ask, right? We don't think there should be anything that prevents someone. When the court answers that question, yes, your rights were violated. We don't think there should be some this secondary test or this secondary doctrine that says, well, only if they were violated in these in certain circumstances or certain ways, and the officer knew what they were doing or knew that knew the law, knew they were violating the law. We want to. We just think that that is beside the point. For as, from a victim's perspective, it is beside the point, and it's what makes victims feel like there's no justice because when the court says to a victim of rights violation or excessive force, whatever it is. The court says to the victim, your rights were violated. We agree with you, but you don't get any, any justice here. You don't get a judgment. In fact, the judgment is against you. And we feel that that's just, that's just not right. Dick is frozen. Um, he looks like he's frozen again. He does. Um, I know his internet is unstable. Oh, yeah. He dropped out and will drop back in. Yep. Um, I'd say take over, Senator Bruce. All right. Um, so one second here while I just make sure. Um, OK. Ben, do you have anything you'd like to add here? You're muted, Ben. Ben, you're muted. Whoop. Can Ben, can you guys hear me? Okay, Ben. Right. I failed to unmute myself. Um, so for the record, Ben Novogrosky, uh, Office of Legislative Counsel. I, I believe I can hopefully lend some clarity as far as the concerns that Senator White weighs raised about you know the concept of what Zulo said as far as constitutional actions um you know really with with that it was this uh, can I just break in Ben just for a second I keep getting thrown out so Senator Baruth please chair the meeting this is my third time trying to get back in okay no problem thank you go ahead, go ahead Ben 
Sure. Um, it was this concept of, and, and Senator White, you were correct to the, to the degree in, in that the Supreme Court said that there are certain constitutional provisions that are quote unquote self-executing that have an implied private right of action that you can bring um, in a court for a remedy. However, the next step or a part of that analysis was even if you could bring an action, it was whether or not damages or a proper remedy under the action you could bring. And part of the way that this bill was drafted was to encapsulate or reflect that language um, in the sense that the bill's language kind of contains this self-limiting language as far as constitutional actions, where it says ones that provide a private right of action. What this bill would do was just attach a damages remedy to those actions that you can already bring but the Supreme Court said without legislative direction, essentially, that if there's another remedy for those violations, they'll, they'll look to find it. This bill is to provide direction to say that the remedy to be had is damages or money. Uh, so that's part of that. So you were correct in the sense that you could bring them, but this lends clarity as to what the result or remedy would be in those circumstances. Um, and then, you know, so I think that that was a point of confusion. Does that lend a little bit of clarity as far as those constitutional violations? It, it does, thank you. And I guess, um, what other remedy would there be? Well, you know, in that case specifically, the state put forth a bunch of different alternatives. Um, so you could do injunctive relief. So basically saying that the state is prohibited from stopping vehicles that had covered registration stickers. Um, they could say that you could bring an action under the federal statute, section 1983, but as we've discussed, the federal constitution, the fourth amendment differs than our Vermont equivalent. Right. The Vermont one provides broader uh, mm -hmm. protection. So not all alternative remedies would be adequate necessarily. And so, this is designed to just, I think, give consistency as opposed to where the courts have kind of have discretion on a case by case basis to decide one way or the other. And I think that also goes to the clearly established right issue that we were discussing earlier as well is that, you know, you, you're correct. I mean, there is this is derived from from Vermont case law in the sense that, you know, clearly established law just means that the contours of the right are sufficiently clear that a reasonable official would understand that what they are doing violates that right. That is what you quoted before. But it's been interpreted that, you know, any lawyers love to debate. And I think that, again, this is to provide to consistency for the courts, um, as opposed to the courts navigating it individually themselves. And, you know, so the, the purpose of this is to give some legislative direction to say that, these are the rights that can be brought, and this is the remedy that can be sought, as opposed to the courts trying to do the analysis themselves on a case-by-case -case basis, trying to find similar circumstances to apply to a new case before them. So um, our agenda says uh, committee discussion and next steps, and we're coming up on noon we have about 15 minutes left senator sears do you do you want to um go there at this point well i think uh senator white has you know raised some important issues um not the least of which is some confusion about different cases and i, I don't know if there's uh, somebody who would like to speak from the opposition side on that, on those issues. We've heard from our alleged council. We've heard from proponents of the legislation, Jay Diaz and Brad Meyerson. So I, I'm, I don't know if somebody would like to comment on the other side. Wilda, would you like to comment? Um, Wilda White. Um... Uh, Tucker Jones is here, who is also who works for an attorney uh, for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, maybe we can uh, tag team and, and Tucker can talk about um, the cases and I can comment on um, 
other issues. Um, I would, and, and perhaps I'll, I'll start um, with, um, I'm, I'm speaking, you know, I, I have I, Mad Freedom, the organization I founded, is opposed to this bill. And, you know, I've been speaking here as um, also a policy consultant with Department of Public Safety because, you know, our interests uh, and concerns about the bill are aligned. Um, and what I'm going to say now, I haven't like run it by anybody, but I think it's important for this committee because these other bills from other jurisdictions were raised to understand a little bit about what those other bills have done. And so I'd like to actually address that um, because I have talked about how this bill differs considerably from what other jurisdictions have done. Um, and Brad Nyerson alluded to those bills and I'd like to give you a little bit more detail about that, if I may. Yeah, you got, I mean, we've got about 10 minutes, so. I'll do it in less than that. Okay, so I've talked about Colorado's bill. So, it, you know, it, it's limited to cal co constitutional violations of the Colorado um, Constitution. Um, it um, has a mandatory attorney's fee provision. It has a two-year statute of limitations. Um, and so I've, I've talked about that. But what I'd rather talk about now is New Mexico and Connecticut. New Mexico particularly, I think, is a great example of good bill drafting. Um, New Mexico eliminates qualified immunity for all government officials. They also have limitations on liability. So um, like per occurrence, it's uh, $2 million and it, it goes up with inflation. That's responsible legislating. They also have a notice of claim provision. So with one year of being injured, you have to file a notice of claim with the government. That way the government can actually manage the risk, right? Because that's what you want to do. The more information you have, the more you can manage uncertainty. That's responsible legislating. Um, they also um, have an explicit provision in the bill that it's not retroactive. Very responsible le uh, legislation, uh, legislating because under this current bill, you haven't said one way or the other. Clever well, lawyer. Well, I take exception to being okay. called irresponsible. I'm not, I'm okay? sorry, you should. And, I, and, and I that is uh, very offensive to the chair, to the vice chair, and other members of this committee, Will. I don't know that you can say that we're irresponsible. I that's, don't that's mean outrageous. to say that you're, Senator Sears, you are right to correct me if you feel like that's what I'm saying. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is here is a bill that I think represents responsible legislating. You haven't passed any bill. You are looking at this and you're inviting people to comment to get to the best thing you can do. I wouldn't say you're responsible legislators. You haven't even passed anything and that is not my intent to, of doing so. I welcome the fact that you've invited us to speak here and that's all I'm trying to do. And, if, and I apologize to anybody who thought I was contrasting your proposed bill, which you haven't passed on, to these past bills. Um, so thank you for correcting me because I don't want you leaving with that impression. It wasn't what, what I was trying to say. Um, that. Thank you. You're, you're, you're welcome. Um, and the other thing that the New Mexico bill doesn't do, it doesn't abrogate all immunities, right? It only abrogate, it only changes the qualified uh, immunity. It doesn't change the statutory immunities uh, or, or, or other amenities. It's very limited. Um, and then the um, last thing, it does have a, um, it does provide for an indemnification provision. It makes clear that um, the, you know, any officer sued under the bill would be entitled to both legal defenses and the judgment. Um, and then in terms of uh, Colorado, um, it, it's also limited in terms of excuse me, and the last thing they do is you don't have to pay if the uh, officer, or the officer has to reimburse, excuse me, excuse me, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to, actually, I'm gonna stop and let Tucker talk because I know you're, you're, you're pressed for time. Uh, if you wanna come back to Connecticut, Thank I can you. talk about Connecticut. I appreciate that, thank you. Hello, hello everyone, hello, hello Chair Sears. Senators, my name is Tucker Jones. I'm Assistant General Counsel at the Department of Public Safety. Um, Chair, 
Sears, would you like me to speak uh, now in response to uh, your earlier question about this concern regarding Zulo? We just lost Senator Sears again. Absolutely, Tucker. Uh, we have, <laughs> we have uh, only about five or six minutes for you, but please go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, Chair Bruth. <laughs> um, Vice Chair Bruth. <laughs> but Vice Chair Bruth. Okay. Uh, so I've been studying this issue uh, for quite some time, and I've been following uh, the committee testimony and discussion about this. And um, the Colorado bill uh, and law ending qualified immunity, you know, expressly created a cause of action under the Colorado state constitution, including its uh, its own search and seizure provision there. And, uh, and your legislative council has explained this in the memo comparing the two bills about how it does that. Um, the Vermont Supreme Court had already done that. They had already created a cause of action under the Vermont search and seizure provision in 2019. It's, um, it's largely considered like a landmark case. It's 85 paragraphs long. It's a unanimous decision by the Vermont Supreme Court um, they explicitly, and this is of what's particular, uh, of particular relevance, I think, for this committee, is that they explicitly created an alternative to the federal clearly established standard. And they provided that a plaintiff may show that an officer acted in bad faith. They defined bad faith, which uh, as something that may exist when an officer's conduct could be viewed as objectively reasonable, but is characterized by ill will or wrongful motive, including discriminatory animus. When you Google this case, um, as Senator White alluded to, the uh, second uh, entry, I think, is a summary of the case by what looked to be legislative counsel, I think Eric Fitzpatrick, just kind of summarizing the whole case in about six pages. Um, and there's a note in, in there under, underneath this uh, alternative standard. It says, no, this was a rejection of the United States Supreme Court's approach under the Fourth Amendment. Since the United States Supreme Court had held that the officer's bad faith is otherwise irrelevant uh, if there is a neutral and reasonable basis for the search or seizure. Um, I would consider this decision critical to understanding the legal landscape surrounding qualified immunity in Vermont, um, because it's important to understand that the bad faith showing that a plaintiff may make under a, a claim under Article 11 is an alternative to the clearly established federal standard, uh, the clearly established standard that has been criticized by national social uh, and legal uh, commentators. And it's just very important for this committee to understand that we already have a cause of action under the state constitution and the unanimous Vermont Supreme Court considered these issues in quite a bit of detail. Um, they considered whether it was appropriate to have some limitation akin to qualified immunity and the unanimous Supreme Court considered that it was appropriate and necessary to do so. And I think that's just a very important uh, thing for this committee to understand that the Vermont Supreme Court has already weighed this issue and they thought that some protections akin to qualified immunity were appropriate, but they provided an alternative to showing bad faith by an officer from their discriminatory animus or otherwise. Um, and this is a key point because the reason the some version of qualified immunity is appropriate is because the courts want to ensure that the government employee is on fair notice that their conduct is violating the constitution when they engage in that conduct. And the Supreme Court discussed this by specifically highlighting how this affects uh, law enforcement officers operating in the field. And I think it would be uh, helpful to explain this. They said, Having no protection akin to qualified immunity could create a potential flood of litigation for every alleged constitutional violation. That's not my language. That's a unanimous uh, decision by the Vermont Supreme Court. That's their language. We're just 
we're just letting you know that that language exists. And then they go on to say, on a daily basis, law enforcement officers must make numerous decisions on how to handle interactions with the citizens, particularly motorists. Even with liability falling on the state rather than the individual officer, a rule that exposes the state to a potential civil damages suit following every roadside stop or whenever a motion to suppress is granted could inhibit law enforcement officers from taking some effective and constitutionally permissible actions in pursuit of public safety, this would not be an appropriate result. I, I, the, one of the highlights of this paragraph, and they say it in passing, is that whenever a motion to suppress is granted, and what they're referring to there is on a regular basis, trial courts, criminal courts in our state grant motions to suppress, which by their very nature state that an officer's actions were in violation of the Constitution. Now, there is no indication in those motions to suppress that are granted that the violations are necessarily uh, anything other than a mistaken but reasonable belief by the officer that their conduct was uh, appropriate at the time. But what we would be doing by eliminating qualified immunity is allowing a civil lawsuit with, for potential of attorney's fees following every single motion to suppress that it's granted in court. Because by its very nature, those decisions are stating that the, uh, that the officer's conduct was unreasonable. And as the Vermont Supreme Court indicated, that is both un that's not an appropriate result because it would result in a flood of litigation after every single one of those cases, potentially, but it would also inhibit officers from carrying out their duties that we ask them to do because they would be concerned about a potential civil suit every time a criminal court grants a motion to suppress. So that's the legal considerations that the department views around this bill. There's many, many other considerations, but I know we're out of time for today. Uh, and we welcome the opportunity to discuss that further. Okay, well, we'll give you that opportunity on Thursday morning. But what was the name of that case? That's uh, Zulo v. State, 2019 okay, so, VT1. Is okay, the, uh, so that you're quoting from Zulo, which has created um, a great deal of confusion. So why don't we pick up there on Thursday morning? Um, and I uh, apologize to everyone, um, and especially Wilder, if I was a little bit overly sensitive about the irresponsible versus responsible language. Um, perhaps I was a bit oversensitive. Um, Senator Sears, I appreciate you bringing it up so that I can address it. So thank you. Thank you.